Hello, my name's Helen Lentil. I'm the Fellow in Distance Learning at the University of Leicester in the United Kingdom. I'm here in Vancouver with the Commonwealth of Learning where we're working on a video project about leadership and management in distance learning. I'm joined today by Alison Mead Richardson, who has a vast experience in various roles in distance learning. Welcome, Alison. Thanks, Helen. Alison, you've had a diverse and varied career in distance learning. Can you briefly describe this for us? I moved into distance learning uh, from a background in video production and corporate communication. Uh, I started at the University of Bath where I was manager for flexibility in learning in higher education, a higher education funding council research project. Then I was given the opportunity to work in Namibia in Africa as the technical advisor for the Namibian College of Open Learning and I did that for three years and I learned an enormous amount there. I stayed in Africa for 10 years working on a range of different projects for development partners such as European Union, uh, DFID, African Development Bank, ILO, and I worked in Zambia, Botswana, Rwanda, uh, Namibia, South Africa, and also the Solomon Islands. I've managed projects in teacher education, in open schooling, in uh, tertiary education, adult basic education, and also more recently in technical and vocational education. And then in uh, 2009, I moved to Col to be the education specialist for technical and vocational education. I currently manage um, projects in about 15 Commonwealth countries in technical and vocational education, distance education. Thanks, Alison, very interesting. In what way is distance learning different to conventional face-to-face -face provision? There are many differences between um, distance education and conventional education. For me, one of the most important is the difference in the teaching and learning process. Um, with distance education, learners need to take more responsibility for their learning and teachers need to let go a little bit. Um, and teachers, the teacher's role is changed quite considerably. The, the teaching and learning happens through the, the materials which have to be produced um, way in advance of the actual process happening. And so teachers have to put in, have to have this sort of systematic approach to developing the learning content so that the, the students have this interactive experience. So both teachers and students need capacity building, need training, need sensitizing to these new roles. Another difference is in the management processes. Um, you know, there are all kinds of organizational structures which are different with, with distance education. And from an institutional point of view, those need to be managed differently. For example, team working. Um, conventional education tends to rely on an individual teacher who goes into a classroom, closes the door, and what goes on in that classroom is, is the business of that teacher. Whereas with distance education, um, a whole group of people, different people are involved in, in the teaching and learning materials production. Um, and that process of team working has to be managed quite carefully. Can you expand a bit more on how these differences impact on the management and leadership of distance learning provision? Otto Peters talked about distance learning as the industrialised form of, of, of education. And what he meant by that was there's a whole new system involved. You know, we've got um, specialisation, high division of labour, mechanisation, automation. And it's, it's that that leads us into the need for uh, a course team made famous by um, British Open University and, and, and their approach to course team development. So the impact for, for managers is dealing with the way that uh, their teachers and the support staff and the other professionals um, are, are involved in this teaching and learning process. And for some institutions that's quite problematic because um, particularly government institutions who are starting, who are you know, going dual mode, um, those kinds of roles don't exist in, in the government uh, staff establishment. So um, there is a need for, for changes at all sorts of levels so that you've got appropriate staff with appropriate skills, different skills, all working together to produce a, a high quality teaching and learning um, experience for the learners. 
There are other differences um, to do with the cost structure. I think that um, most people don't realise that distance education has a different cost structure from uh, conventional education. With distance education, you need a, a large injection of cash at the start of the process. Writers have to be paid, materials have to be printed or produced, distance learning, um, e-learning materials have to be developed. And all of this has to be paid for um, and made ready in advance of any learners enrolling for a course and any fees being paid. So governments need to recognize the need for um, solid financial uh, models and, and so, uh, robust funding mechanisms to enable that, that cash to be available um, in order for the, the system to work. With conventional education, the funding, um, the highest cost element is staff salaries and that's more or less fixed on a monthly basis and governments know exactly how much that's going to be each month. Um, and with conventional education then the fees are paid up front and, and the, the cost structure is, is more manageable. So there has to be that recognition um, of this difference and unfortunately Governments and institutions try to squeeze a, a new model of distance education into an old financial model of, of conventional education and it ends up with um, distance education programs being underfunded, under-resourced, not having the right staff um, and of course it's, it's, it's extremely difficult to produce a quality product. Following on from this Alison, what are the common mistakes that are made in distance learning? Probably the most common mistake is putting too much emphasis on the materials part of distance education. Um, developing materials is, is costly, it's time consuming, it takes a lot of effort and institutions when they're beginning with distance education tend to really seriously focus on that aspect and neglect the, the other two very important parts which are management and administration systems and learner support systems. In Africa we use an image of an African three-legged stool um, and we say that the three legs must be equally strong and robust otherwise the stool's not going to be able to do its job and that, that seems to help people and so um, I would say that's, that's the, the, the most common mistake. Um, that can be mitigated of course if you ensure that your management systems are as, are as, as strong and, and as well developed and you give as, as much attention to them as you do to your materials development. The other common mistake is underestimating the amount of time that it takes to develop materials. Um, if you've not done this before, uh, teachers seem to think, well, we, you know, we develop materials all the time for, for teaching and learning. But particularly with a team approach, it does take longer because other people are involved and um, different specialist roles are involved. And so most managers, institutional managers, do underestimate just how long it's going to take from um, designing a distance learning course to actually being able to offer it and quite often um, institutions get forced by you know um, policy makers to launch programs long before they're actually ready. Um, I have been involved in many programs where we've been forced to launch when we've only got the first module ready and it's not a nice experience. So those are the, the most common mistakes in terms of, of institutions. The other common mistake I think is that um, there's this idea in circulation in governments that um, distance education is, is cheaper than, than conventional education. Research carried out by uh, Rumble and Cool has shown in, in open schooling, for example, indeed secondary education can be uh, provided um, through distance learning at about two-thirds uh, two of the cost of conventional education. but. That can only happen when you've got um, certain management systems in place, when you've got robust um, financial models in place, and there are good quality um, assurance mechanisms. And I think also in terms of institutions, that's another, an, another mistake that's often made, which is not using um, quality criteria as your, your planning, um, planning tool. And we tend to focus on quality criteria for distance education developed by NADIOSA, which is the National Association of Distance Education Organizations in Southern Africa. And they have a very comprehensive set of quality criteria, which make a good planning tool, as well as a good monitoring and evaluation tool. So what advice would you give to distance learning leaders? 
both institutional leaders and government leaders? Oh, there's a range of advice that, that we give leaders of institutions and, and government people involved in distance education. Um, distance education is usually employed to meet national objectives of increasing access um, to various education systems. Um, I'm reminded of uh, something Tony Dodds wrote in um, The Open School where he said that you know one of the critical success factors is that there is this robust funding model for uh, from government to the institution um, all the things that we've talked about earlier of ensuring that that, that um, distance education is properly resourced but Tony also drew attention to the idea of um, institutional leadership being innovative and entrepreneurial and this is certainly something that we found in the TVET institutions that we work with Institutions need to take a different approach, uh, a different view of the learner. Uh, it's the learner as a customer. And you know, you don't see that so much in conventional education, but it's absolutely critical in, in well-functioning distance education systems. Institutions need to provide a service to their learners. And this is quite a change for both ministry people as well as institutional managers. And as we said earlier, there's a strong focus on staff development when you're introducing a distance education system, but it tends to be focused on at the institutional level, so the teachers and the managers get a lot of, of capacity building. And the advice I would give is to ensure that policy makers and ministry officials also get that staff development, are also exposed to you know, the differences between conventional and distance education in order that they can manage, help to manage the process. Ministry officials are responsible for uh, monitoring and evaluation for accreditation systems and for the policies that, that guide you know, educational provision. So if they don't understand and, and buy in to distance education methodologies as much as institutional staff and managers, then there's a, a mismatch. So I think that's probably the strongest advice I would give. Staff development for, um, for, for it, uh, um, ministry officials but also um, cultivating that innovation and, and entrepreneurial spirit because that's what will help to make it a, a viable business model and ultimately sustainable. Because the importance of distance education is that um, in the long term, through these new teaching and learning methodologies, we will actually be able to provide quality education to the increasing number of, of people who need it. Many thanks, Alison, for sharing your insights with us today. I know that people who've seen this video will learn a lot from you. I certainly have. Thank you. Thank you.